and we are on. Okay, welcome. Thanks again. Thanks for coming in a rainy day. That was, that's really brave of you guys. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about time patterns in JavaScript today. My name is Tiago. We're going to talk a little bit about myself and what I do, and then we're going to jump into the meeting uh, and the content. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that I want to make this as much helpful as it can to you. So I'm going to try to see, you know, the, I'm going to try to adjust to the level of you guys. So I'm going to be asking a few questions. And I'm going to try to spend more time on the points that would fill in for most of you guys. But still, if you think it's kind of hard for you to keep the pace, but the majority is keeping the pace, then just bear with me a little bit, and I can get you on questions, and whenever you do breaks, I can answer you. So if you think there are some gaps that you would like to hear more, then I'm totally fine to do that whenever we do the, we do the breaks. So I'm going to open up for questions. And if you think you are already there, you know this already, so then we can use your help to help me with the people that are starting. So we can try to balance out each other. Okay? So let me get started. And one quick thing, I have posted those slides on the Meetup group because for the challenges, I would like you guys to open the slide whenever I get to that because there are some links that I would like you guys to try to forward and and play with. Having that said, voila! So this is me, me and my wife on the Golden Gate Park, rollerblading on a sunny morning close to the Young Museum. That's something we'd love to do. I'm going to say I'm a JavaScript PI, I'm a dog daddy, a vegetarian rollerblading, and I'm not a typical Brazilian. <laughs> um, I'm a technical manager at Avenue Code. I'm a tech lead here at Macy's, and this is my Twitter, and I have a website. I'm going to go back to those at the end of the talk as well. And here is my email if you want to ask anything about things that have been mentioned here or further questions. I'm all open. All right. And one slide about Avenue Code. I have already mentioned Avenue Code, but just briefly. Our company of consulting and we do uh, service our clients with a range of consultants from you know back end development, front end development, DevOps, product management, QA, and so forth. So if you're interested, you have heard it already. I'm not gonna take more time on that. Um, and here are some of our clients as well. Now let's get to the point. Agenda of today. Patterns and design patterns, JavaScript design patterns, and we're gonna cover today constructor, facade, module, and within module we're gonna go about CommonJS, AMD, ES 2015, and observer or event. Okay. Patterns. What is a pattern? Well, in the context of solving problems. Pattern is a proven solution to a certain class of problems in a specific context. And this applies to pretty much anything. Every pattern comes from preconditions or requirements, and it leaves those conditions or consequences. And this term has been coined in architecture by the guy called Christopher Alexander from Berkeley. And and made to design cities and buildings. So, because, you know, we always had the same challenges and same solutions to decide to catalog the solutions. And he created a catalog of patterns in 77. So, he created a network of patterns which form a pattern language. And a pattern language is something really useful because when you talk to your colleagues about the challenges you have, you can use the pattern term you are already giving much more information. So this pattern ABC can be used for that problem. So they want to know about, okay, what ABC is about, what are the consequences, what does it take to, how much does it take to implement ABC. So it becomes part of our vocabulary. And as long as we have a network of connected patterns, because one pattern can lead to another pattern, as we're going to see 
it favors reuse because you can think, oh, I'm going to use this pattern, but I could also use this pattern together. So, you know, we are reusing the ideas over and over. All right? So, those are patterns. What are design patterns? So, in computing, design patterns can address problems in object oriented languages. So, there was a book in 1994 from four guys, not in Singapore. They published this. Design Patterns book, and it was a turning point for programming in object oriented languages. This book came with 23 like, classic fundamental design patterns categorized in creational, structural, and behavioral. And many people today believe that if you use the word design pattern, you can only talk about those 23, but that's not true. I think design pattern can be anything. Any pattern that's going to help you on designing your system. So that was 1994. That was, you know, 22 years ago. So we have different patterns today. We have different problems, different challenges, as you're going to see. But you can use the term anyway. Even outside of programming, I have found out that inside UX, design pattern word term is very much well used as well as in accessibility. So just think of a way to solve your problems. And back in 94, the support for programming languages to design patterns was pretty heavy. It was hard for one to implement the code behind the idea of the pattern. But over the years, the languages have adopted more support. So today, languages are Python or Java. They have a lot of built-in support for Pattern. And some of the constructs, they are actually patterns, like iterate. So many of those terms that you're going to talk today, you may have seen already in your code, or you may have heard from someone, because those are meant to be kind of universal. All right. Now, JavaScript design pattern. Well, JavaScript code has been more complex than ever before. Why? Because we want a dazzling experience and crazy interaction. We want asynchronous calls, callbacks, promises. We want single page application. And, you know, it's not easy to make that in a very clean way. Especially if you work for a company where the code grows and we need to, stand, to put some standards around it. So, some of the good reasons to use design patterns in JavaScript are one, to avoid the spaghetti code, which is just like a bowl of the spaghetti, with pull, and lots of stuff comes together, which means unstructured code or hard to read code, code that you cannot you know, chop it off and create a component out of it easily, so you really need to read kind of the, the dependencies. If it's hard to read, probably is a spaghetti. Um, it's good for better maintainability. So if you exercise, you know, patterns, if you program using patterns, it becomes easier for people to maintain it because they can tell what the code is about. They can understand what are the boundaries of, of certain behavior so that they can, you know, express, express using patterns. It will make it clear where to think of it. And you can develop far more objective unit tests. So um, I want to know who here likes or works or would like to do more unit tests in your code. So guys in favor? Good. That's great. And if you didn't hit raise your hand, it's okay. But <laughs> don't feel bad for it. But unit tests is something that I personally recommend to all of you guys to be, you know, a little bit proficient in it because it's a great thing for quality. So it will help your code to keep the quality and it will protect your code from other people breaking, doing breaking changes. So the unit is gonna break on his hand, not on yours. So if we use that pattern, it helps us to separate the code first and can, then you can write more objective unit tests. So you can write a unit test only for a specific aspect of the code and isolate the other aspect. That's the point. 
Today we are covering some of the work of two great guys that wrote books about time time in JavaScript for internet and maybe as money, and some of other things that came from my own experience. So let me ask you guys the question. How many people here please hold your uh, raise your hands if you have been exposed to design patterns and you know like how to apply or you have seen at least once how to apply design patterns in the code? Okay, so a little bit more than half. Good. Very well. And one just for my curiosity, have you guys seen design patterns in other languages not JavaScript? Very well. Thank you. So, if you're going to use design patterns, you need to remember Uncle Ben. With power comes responsibility. And it is true because people get into the patterns fever. They want to patternize everything. And that's so funny, okay? But you need to make sure the patterns they are using, they are helping you. And if you have way too many, too much of them, it becomes hard because unnecess unnecessary. And it can make a cool complex unnecessarily. So be mindful about using patterns. They have specific problems to be solved. So if you don't see a certain problem to be solved, maybe you shouldn't apply the pattern just to say, hey, I'm using patterns. No, the point is use when it's needed. Okay? Constructor. That's going to be our first pattern. And that's not really much of a pattern compared to the other patterns. So that's a little intro to the pattern. This is a creation of pattern and the purpose is to initialize a newly created object or once the memory has been allocated. This is something that is very trivial in JavaScript. That was more of a pattern for C or other languages where you need to allocate the memory and do a lot of complex operations. You know, JavaScript has a new and that's, I'm gonna explain some ways to, to initialize, but normally we don't have big problems around building objects. However, I want to get you guys into the subject. So, what is the precondition? We have a definition for the object. And the post condition, we have a customized object allocated in the memory. So, how does it look? Oh, yeah. JavaScript is an object oriented language, but it differs from the classic object orientation like Java, where you have a lot of stuff, a lot of work to create a class and define interface and stuff. In JavaScript, things are easier. So you can define objects in different ways. Um, the first way here, you can just create a literal object. Which you can name it as a single is another time pattern that I would not call it today. This works as a single thing, but that's not a single thing time pattern itself. And I'm going to mention it later, right? But think about objects literal. So this object is once. There is just one copy of that object. That's it. When we got hacking script number five, we got this object dot create function. If you're throwing, yes, if you're throwing a prototype, you can create an, an object from the prototype using object dot create. Which is a cool thing because this guy can be dynamic. You can create guys on a set. And the regular way that everybody learns first when you run JavaScript is the new. So you have some object, you're going to do new to that object. And that's actually a constructed function, which I'm going to explain in the next slide. How can you use functions to create objects? So I'm creating a dog, and how does the dog constructor look like? So this is the function dog. So just create a function, name it dog, and here we are passing some attributes. So that's some variables name and grid, and I'm gonna assign those to my object context, which is under this. So inside the constructor, if you use this, it will reference to the newly created object. The object is getting created. So when you return that we don't use return, like for this function specifically, 
if this is new, but the return of the new is going to be an object that will have as attributes name and grid come from this to one. So we can define attributes and we can define functions. So here I'm creating a function called bar, which is a function that will return the name and the final block. So as an example, I'm instantiating my dog Sherlock, which is a beagle. So I'm doing your dog, passing those two, name and breed, that's gonna and I'll and I'm in here and name is gonna be assigned to this dot name. Breed is gonna be assigned to breed, this dot breed, and this guy's gonna get a function called bark. So if we do console.log my dog dot bark, that's gonna return the name which came from this guy here plus woof. And you're gonna see Sherlock calling Woof. So this is the basic structure, the basic construct. I think I have provided an example here. So every snippet of code that I'm gonna show today, I have provided a plunker um, link. Okay, so let me. It's not so good. Okay, so this example, this is a page. So Plunker is pretty good that you can touch the code in one panel and see the output in the other panel. This is just a page which runs this script called main.js. Can you guys, it is okay? Do you think I should increase the font? Is it working for you guys? Okay. So here I'm defining that same code, function dog, taking a name and a breed, defining a function called bark, and I'm instantiating this dog using my dog, and I'm appending to this DOM element called content, like the ID of, so going back to the index HTML, there is an, an element that has an ID equals to content, so on main.js, I'm going to retrieve that guy, and on inner HTML, I'm going to append my dog dot park, and you're going to see this is coming from the app. Okay. So, do you guys have any questions so far? Excellent. So this is the basic constructor. Now, let's learn. Let's go a little bit deeper. Prototype. Well, when we define a method inside the constructor, that's not a very good practice because every new instance is going to carry it's a new definition for the function. So, oh, back to this code. If we are to instantiate 100 objects for that, each one of those 100 objects is going to have a new function definition. So every one of them is going to have their own bit of our function separate. So that I will teach more of the memory. So how to fix it? If we write on the function's prototype, then all the instances can share the same definition of a method. Like here. So I have changed that code. So my function does is the same, but I do dog dot prototype dot bar to define that same function using the same div, but I broke it from inside the constructor to outside to the prototype. And I will use it the same exact way. However, if I are if I am to instantiate 100 dots, all of those dots will use the same definition, the same single definition of bar which is better for your memory. So every time you define an object, a constructor, it's a good practice to add like methods to the prototype. Okay? And I've also provided a plunker, I guess. I forgot to put it here, I'm sorry. But I did. <laughs> I did somewhere. <laughs> So I'm going to get to this right now. Here, prototype. Yeah. 
this is that's the same code and now I decided to add another dog so I've added whiskey which was my first dog and he is a husky so now you know both dogs are using the same definition of bark which is the same code I showed you guys before all right so let's move on there is a new guy a new player called class so in the new version of javascript currently yes, there is a new syntax studio to make the same thing easier to code and more straightforward to read which is a class so we can rewrite that thing as a class of dog so that function dog will be now our constructor you can pass the same name with this and your function bar you, you no longer need the function like keyword you can just say bar here and this is the return and one more thing, in ES 2015, we now have the back tick. So, you know, like before, we were doing the plus to compatibility string. So, we were putting the name plus group. Now, we can just have one single sentence and we can refer to JavaScript inside with the dog. That's another cool thing that came in ES 2015. Both things are already available to you in Chrome and WebKit. And I think Firefox as well. But normally, um, in a company that wants to support other browsers, you will be using some transpiler to modify this code and kind of compile it to code that other browsers can read, which is like the other specific version of JavaScript. But you can just focus on the source. Okay? So this is how we define dog using the 2015. We are going to use it exactly the same way. Okay? And I have also provided a Plunker link for that, which is here. Pretty much the same thing. I'm also, I have Sherlock, I have Whiskey, so they are both barking for me here. And oh, is working as expected. So all those. Yes? It, it is. Very good question. And you know what's interesting? If you use some transpiler like Babel, they're going to actually transform this code into exactly the, the previous slide. So it's going to be a function dog and this byte will be assigned to the prototype. So it comes from the prototype the same way. If you don't want it to be on a prototype for some reason, then you would have to code this guy inside the constructor, just like the first example. But since you play outside, then you come to the program. Still inside the class. There we go. Cool. So you guys are going to get your hands dirty playing with classes very soon. Now, that's what I have for constructor. I'm going to move on to the next pattern. Okay. All of those Plunker links, they are forkable. You can play as much as you, you don't. You don't even need to fork. You can just play and do your changes and hit run and see what happens. But you can fork on your own account to have your own copy if you want. All right, next one, facade. A facade is a structural pattern, and the purpose is to provide a more convenient high-level interface to a component that's more complex behind the scenes. It represents one of the main principles from the Gang of Four, which is program to an interface, not an implementation. So as long as you follow the interface and everybody plays with the interface, it should be okay to change things behind the scenes. So that's the idea to separate you know, the concerns of who is consuming the code from who is you know, really implementing the code behind. And we call facade when we refer to the high-level interface. The precondition is a complex low-level code chunk, and the post-condition is a simplified high-level interface. For instance, let's suppose we want to print out a JSON file from a server. Okay? So, 
If you want to do that in vanilla JavaScript, you need to do a lot of code here. So you need to create an HTML, XML HTTP request, you need to program a function called load callback, check if this status is 200, and then call it or call back using JSON.parse, and then you open the get request, and then it sends, you know? But that's kind of complex in all that. But if you just want, you know, to make an AJAX call, passing a URL in the callback, you can simplify by creating a function AJAX, where all you, all you need to know is the URL and the callback. That's going to be called after the function comes back. So, in some way, we are reducing the complexity so the programmers do not need to know about what goes on behind the scenes. We just need to use Ajax. So this is a facade. Okay. And that's about the idea. That tells us what, which details should we focus on. Because if tomorrow I want to replace my Ajax implementation, there is a new API called fetch. So if I want to replace from this to fetch, I don't need to change my interface, so the code that's already in the index that doesn't need to change. I also have a Plunker link for that. Okay. So, this is a nice example. That is the same Ajax function, and I am calling it passing a callback which is uh, I'm using yes 2015 as well so this is my callback I don't need to use function anymore the function to work I can define a function by using arrow so why not would be my first argument so Ajax is here that's the same index that's the same URL but this is my callback function which takes an argument called planet, and this is the body of the function. So inside the function, I'm getting the element by ID content, and I'm also using let instead of var, because let, if you just replace var with let, let's gonna respect this code. So if you want to have a new plot, that var is not gonna be hoisted to the top of the body function. So just think as a var where you see let, and then we are appending some stuff to the inner HTML of the content using again the backseat and the dollar sign. So this is a Star Wars API. So as wapi.com, I want to get information about the planet which is the first planet, which is Tatooine. So I'm going to say, when I do that call, I receive back an object, which is the planet. And planet has name, terrain, population. So, and I'm going to just print it out. So it comes as, this is Tatooine, a desert planet with 200,000 residents. So you just had to call this functional Ajax passing the URL and the callback. You didn't need to know what happened behind the scenes. So that's the idea behind the facade. Okay? Oh yeah, sure. Yes, sure. This is actually a regular function, this is more about the meaning of the function. So we are creating a function to abstract portions of the code that we don't need to get involved. Because there are different ways for you to do this. If you know you had a task, okay, you need to make an agent call and train the content of the client. You could have done everything into one single function. So you could have done one function that does this all, and here you would do this. But that's not, uh, that has the entire logic of Ajax within your function. So in this case, we are separating. This Ajax could even, could even be a common component, a common file that you just require, and you just call it here. So it is like a regular function that is being made more readable in, in the sense of abstracting the information behind it. Not necessarily. It could just do stuff. You know, it could be a function that gets something done. So sometimes you could even do that and not pass any code. And it's just about the idea of abstracting the complexity that happens behind. So you could take a callback, you could do different things. I'm going to show a different example as well.
but my examples do happen to have a color. <laughs> but that's not mandatory. Um, so let's see another example. I don't know how to pronounce it. I have asked Christine, and I think it's iffy, but I'm not American, so maybe I'm doing wrong. <laughs> so this is an acronym for immediately involved function express, which is a function that you declare and run at the same time. In one shot, you get it declared and executed. So it it's going to keep in front of bar and come from the fire within the closure. That's a good word. I'm going to go back to the mercy. There are two flavors. Um, here, I'm defining a function. So, this is just another function. And you can do it wrapping parentheses around the function. So, we would wrap the function with a parenthesis here. And right after that, we call it, just like a function. So we are calling, after the parentheses, we are call invoking the function. Or you could wrap the entire expression. So you could declare a function here, call it right away, and add a block of parentheses around it. So both options are valid. And the interesting thing is that everything, everything within the function is like variable to the function, which is not going to get exposed. So you can use this for your facade. So everything that goes here stays here. It doesn't get leaked to our function. Yeah? Is this still relevant with the 2015 with the with the function that keeps the variable in the function that you're preparing? Very good question. So as a matter of fact, it does because we can do more. I and mean, not only the current variable. I'm going to explain a little bit later. We could use this as kind of a module, so as kind of a substitution that could have functions and classes and declarations and more things. But that was, you know, the first way on how to get, you know, some information private to a function. And this is called closure. So closure is when that specific variable or whatever we can do is closed and closed here and belongs to the context of this function. So if you want to pass some information from outside, you could pass, you could create an argument here and pass new involvement. And that will kind of pass a dependency to your I'm going to show that. Okay. That was just the structure of ifs. So let's see an example. This is a function called get current weather. And inside, and a uh, differential here is the return. Um, this function is an issue, so it has some stuff inside. It has another function, and it returns a function. I'm going to show from the user. Okay, so let's say we declare this crazy guy here, and then get current weather, passing San Francisco, like there are three parameters, city, country, and use metric, yes or no, like true or false. So I can do San Francisco with US and false because I, I want Imperial. I can pass Paris from France and true because I want metric. So I pass those three guys that I received here. So the first line is going to determine the unit, like this metric, yes, okay. So it's going to be metric or Imperial. And the second line, we're going to get the URL. And this is long, I'm sorry it didn't fit well in the slide, but this is another backtick uh, long URL that has those parameters here. So this is the call to the API of open weather map. And I'm passing like the city and the country and the units here. So that's going to be an Ajax call. And I'm calling Ajax, you know, the same Ajax that we talked about before. I'm passing the URL and as a callback, I'm passing generate response. Generate response is going to receive use metric and data. And we're just going to, you know, print out to the console the, the weather. So we're going to see if use metric is true, we're going to use the letter C, otherwise we're going to use the letter F. And then we're going to print data. No, this is details about the structure of this 
response that comes back from the server, which is data dot weather. There's an array weather, and the first information is main. So I'm saying this is like the condition, and now how many degrees? And you're gonna see that live. I'm gonna open on Plunker. So why don't we go there right now? All right. In San Francisco, it's raining in 59.65 Fahrenheit. In Paris, there are clouds in 2 Celsius. So this is the same. <laughs> Good thing we are in San Francisco. <laughs> um, and this is the whole code behind it. So I'm sorry, it's not so simple to show quickly on the slide, but you guys can take a little more if you want. But just long story short, our if it is this entire block here. I define Ajax, the same Ajax that we defined as well before here. So it's part of my module, you know, my facade. Get current water is a facade. Because there's a lot of complex stuff going on, Ajax call, making the call, getting the response. But all the user wants to know is I want a city, a country, and the response. I've changed this guy to take a callback. Because in this case, I don't want to print the console, I want to print the DOM. So my function takes city, console, use map, and print as function. And it's doing the same thing, so I'm getting the unit, getting the URL, calling agents. Generated response is gotten back from the call, and I'm using print fn, so I'm calling this function print to DOM with this string. And print to DOM is going to just go to my content element and append. The response. That's, there's a lot of stuff going back and forth. Yeah? Oh, of course. Sorry. Bind is, there is a concept called partial application, which is from functional programming. Um, this is when we want to pass a value to a function even before the function is called. So here, I'm kind of passing city, country, use metric to generate response before the function gets called. So whenever, this is not calling the function, just setting some parameters. So whenever this function gets called, we already got those guys, city, country, use metric, and print event. It's because the first parameter of bind is the context of the function, and that would it could even be this, but it doesn't matter because I'm not using this inside here. So it could be anything. Okay. Okay. So this, uh, we're going to do an example. The first challenge is with this code, so you guys are going to play a little bit with this. But the whole, the whole point of this is we have a complex code behind the scenes and we just do get current weather to get the current weather. Okay? Um, I would like to jump to the challenge right now and I'm open to go and re-explain a part of the code. Okay? So the first challenge, and I guess you guys are going to need my slides now because you need to click on this one. So this is a plunker. That's, it's that same plunker that I just shown to you guys. You can fork from it. So if you have a GitHub account, you can sign in on Plunker with a GitHub account so that anything you write will be saved to you. If you don't want it, it's fine. You can just keep it in your browser. So first, take a moment to understand implementation. And then, I'm going to ask you guys to, let's clean this guy up by creating a class. So we're going to create a class called Location. And one quick thing, in Plunker, you can add new files by going to the left here, doing new file. So I want to actually create a new file. Oh, do I? Sorry, not yet. You guys are going to do that a little later when you go on modules. So now you can use the same file, okay? So don't worry if you use files right now. So on the same file, you know, on the top of the file, write a class called location, which the cons whose constructor receives three attributes, city, country, and use metric. And under location, you're going to write a method called get my current weather, which is going to call that guy, get current weather, that behind the scenes. So we're not going to 
make changes to that guy at this point. We're just creating a new location that receives three CD config use metric and call that get current weather from the method get my current weather and you're gonna pass a function this printer fan now replace after that's done replace the two invocations to get weather from San Francisco and Paris you know the two examples instead of getting using get current weather straight you're gonna do use the new class that you guys are gonna create so you're gonna have two instances of location, one for each city, where you're gonna call get my current weather. So let me just illustrate a little bit how it should become. Like this is the code. We are doing get current weather. Right? Oh I don't know if that's too too low. I'm gonna do a lot of enters. Beautiful. So today, get current weather. Instead of this get current weather, I want to have like a class call location. And I'm gonna do a var, you know, San Francisco is gonna be a new location where you're gonna pass the city, San Francisco, the country, US, and use metric as false. You can create Paris as like a new location, and then you're gonna pass Paris, France, oh. And true. Okay, so you're gonna have your two vars, and then you're gonna do sf dot get my current weather. And here you're gonna pass the call, the same callback that's being used print to DOM. So you're gonna pass print to DOM. Uh oh. Here in Paris, get my current weather. Print to DOM. So here we're gonna be, you know, using those two patterns, construction, using class to create a location, and facade. We're gonna just embed your facade with similar stuff. Okay? Do you guys understand what needs to be done? Yes? Yes, the ES 2015. And this a plunker works with classes. So you can just type it in as long as of course I mean you need to use it. Are you guys using com or WebKit or so? I forgot to mention that you need to use you know some browser that supports that. As long as you're not using an old IE version, it should be fine. Yeah. Babel. Babel is my tool of choice. There is another called Tracer. But Babel. I mean, it requires some setup, so you need to inject. You either do the transpilation behind the scenes, so during build time. So when you build your project, you can transpile and generate your binary, or you can do it live. But doing it live has a performance cost because you need to, to parse the code on the file. I think Plunker supports that, so you may be doing that for you already. <laughs> 